There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together, saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Jesus is recognized on this first Easter day. He is recognized there with these disciples, those who had followed Jesus, who knew Jesus, who listened to him preach. <coughs> He's not known as they're walking together. He's not known as they're talking together. He is known when he breaks the bread, and then suddenly <coughs> they see it, they hear it, they get it. So, what happens on this morning is so momentous. It is so enormous. Not only do our lives hinge on this moment, but all the world, all of creation, all of history hinges on this most incredible miracle that death itself is broken, the grave is defeated, and God Almighty has heard the cries of His people taken on our own lives and our own sin, and He's the one who breaks death. He is the one who triumphs over the grave. Christ is risen indeed. And here on this first morning, they're still trying to figure out what's going on. And you can ask me, well, why don't they recognize him? And I will say, well, I don't know. I don't know. The resurrected body of Christ is this divinely glorified unity between body and soul. And I don't know why these things seem to happen in the way that they do. It is beyond me how he can, like we heard last week, appear in a locked room. I can't do that. You can't do that. Somehow the resurrected body of Jesus can. But before we are tempted to think that he is some ethereal spirit or ghost, remember what he says to Doubting Thomas. Look, I've got the holes in my hands and in my side. Come touch them. Come feel them. He will eat fish with some of his disciples. He will break bread at the end of our gospel. He tells those other disciples, feel and touch and hold. I am real. This is not the work of a ghost. This is not the work of a spirit. This is not the work of an idea or an ideal or true love never dies or he will live forever in your memory. This is body and soul eternally united through divine, inexpressible glory. There at the tomb, Mary Magdalene doesn't even recognize him until he calls her by name. It's only when he says, Mary, oh, I thought you were the gardener. I was asking you where they took the body of my Lord, and now I see that you're alive. These guys on the road to Emmaus, these were not of the 12 disciples or apostles, but these were of the wider group of people who followed Jesus around, who knew him, who loved him, who would listen to the teachings. And they're walking right alongside him, and they don't see it either. Not until the end. So how this happens and, and how exactly, I don't know. I don't understand. I don't think we can know. I don't think we can understand. This is a holy mystery and yet a divine truth in a manner that I think actually points to its veracity. Because think about it in these terms. If we are talking about all of the redemption of creation, if we're talking about an eternal plan before the beginning of the world by an almighty God to redeem those whom he has loved and always loved and always will, if you can figure it out completely and I can understand it completely with my tiny little brain, what are the odds that an almighty God came up with? To me, the fact that it is mysterious, it is beyond our comprehension, it is deeper and broader and wider than we can even take in, points to its truth. Ruth. <coughs> no one would come up with this stuff. Maybe. And so we need to look at this for a second, I think, in the same manner that we did last week with the resurrection appearance and with Doubting Thomas and with a body that still bore wounds. Wounds that were glorified. Wounds that pointed to triumph, but wounds nonetheless. That here on the road to Emmaus, Christ is known in a very particular way. So, he's walking with these guys that he knows, who know him, 
who have listened to him, who have learned from him. And think about the context for a second. This is still Easter morning. And they're walking past Jerusalem, out of Jerusalem, to another town. Already, the rumors of the resurrection have started to spread. And they've spread so far and so wide, everyone in the city is talking about it, and it's even starting to spread outside of the city. This is good news that's so impossibly good, people can't stop talking about it. They've not seen Jesus, but they're starting to hear these rumors, and they're crazy. This is crazy talk. And so these guys, they're talking to each other, and you've heard it too, and I don't get it, I don't understand, and I don't know what's going on. And they are confused, and they're scared, and they're worried, and they're anxious, and they're everything else. Because this is news beyond belief. Then all of a sudden, there's this guy with him. And he's just like, yo, what up? <laughs> and these disciples are like, what do you mean, what up? What have you been, what have you been under a rock? What have you been asleep for three days? Everybody knows what's going on. You caught that, right? <laughs> under a rock. <laughs> I'm just, it was subtle. I was just making sure you caught it. So, they're like, where have you been? Everyone in town is talking about this. We thought this guy was the Messiah. We thought this guy was the long-awaited one whom God had promised to save all the world. We thought that this was the guy, a mighty prophet. We've listened to him. We've believed in him. We've seen the miracles. And they executed him on a cross. It was terrible. I mean, it was just awful. They put him in a tomb. They rolled it in stone in front of it. They sealed it up. There were Roman guards in front of it. And some of our women went down on the third day to take care of the body. The stone is gone. The soldiers are asleep. And the tomb was empty. They're saying he rose from the dead. From the dead. Where in the world have you been that you haven't heard this? Everyone has heard this. It's... It's like nothing we've ever heard of before. It is unbelievable. It is impossible. These rumors are just crazy talk, but we can't stop talking about it. But seriously, risen from the dead? And Jesus says to them, well done. Don't you know your scriptures? Don't you remember? And so Jesus opens the scriptures to them and begins to teach. So Jesus has a Bible study there with these disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he starts pointing out verses they have probably heard a million times. Now, he is not taking some weird, obscure verse out of context, turning it upside down and pointing to things, <laughs> trying to prove some sort of oddball point. He is referring to messianic prophecy that these guys have heard again and again and again. You've gone to temple. You've heard these verses. You've gone to synagogue. You've heard these verses. Didn't you hang out with Jesus? He used to say this stuff all the time. <coughs> that the Messiah must suffer. That the Messiah will die. That on the third day he shall be raised and his people will be redeemed. He starts connecting those dots for them all over again and suddenly they're like, Ooh. Oh my God. How did I forget that? Oh my gosh. How did I not see that? Oh my gosh, you're right. I have heard that a million times. That's amazing. Thank you so much, mysterious stranger, for doing this Bible study with us. Now we finally get it. This is all supposed to happen. This has all been laid out. This has all been planned out throughout Scripture and in the mind of God even before all creation. This is His eternal plan. Wow. Now... Now I see and I understand. But they still don't see. They still don't recognize Christ. The scripture has been opened up to them. They understand the story. They understand the purpose. They understand the miracle. But they don't yet see Jesus right in front of them. They don't yet recognize who it is who is teaching them. But before we get any further, I think we need to clarify a point. When Jesus opens the scriptures and teaches them to these disciples, what are the scriptures? The Old 
Testament. He is not referring to Revelations. He is not referring to the Gospel of John or to 2 Corinthians. Those haven't been written yet. When Jesus teaches from the Scriptures, as he will do again and again and again and again throughout his earthly ministry, you will make reference. The Scriptures say this. The Law and the Prophets, he will teach from the Old Testament. For the Old Testament, just like the New, is the Holy Word of God. And his plan of salvation has been present from the beginning and is there throughout all of Scripture. But if you don't know the Old Testament, you won't recognize this stuff, or it might not make any sense. He has to show them and explain to them through this Bible study all these things they've been hearing all of their lives, but they never put two and two together and got four. It's always been there. It's always been true. And yet, it's just kind of washed right over them in a manner in which they haven't quite connected. So he connects it for them, and finally they understand. But they need to know those scriptures in order to understand. What Jesus is doing here, what Peter does, in both of the readings that we have prior to this, both when he is preaching to the people in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, and what we read in the epistle, his first epistle from chapter 1, he is talking about the fulfillment of the scriptures, and by that he means the Old Testament. So we need to understand first and foremost that old doesn't mean forgotten. Old in Old Testament doesn't mean worn out. Old in Old Testament doesn't mean that it is... It's, you know, it's broken, or it's no good anymore, or it's not worthwhile, or it's been replaced. It's none of those things. It's, it's in essence the first testament to which the New Testament is the second testament. It's the foundation upon which the New Testament is built. And without it, there would be no foundation whatsoever. So when you think old, don't think like decrepit and no good. Think first. Think foremost, think foundational, because it's only in relation to the New Testament that we refer to it as old. Those are the scriptures. That's what Jesus teaches and preaches from. It is those scriptures from the five books of Moses, through the history of Israel in its leaders, rulers, judges, and the chronicles of its kings, through the words of its prophets, that are being fulfilled in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Those are the words that he is opening up and teaching these disciples on the road, and then, oh, now I got it. Now I see. Now I understand. But without that, how does it make any sense for Peter to write, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. If you don't know the Old Testament and the story of the Exodus, what's the point of that? Okay? Our redemption comes through something precious. We've been redeemed by something more worthwhile than gold or silver or money. It's come to the precious blood of Christ who's like a spotless lamb? Why lamb's blood? I mean, I don't even like lamb. It's real gamey. It's kind of kind of greasy. Why not why not the the, the, the blood of a chicken? I like chicken. <laughs> or, or, or nice beef, like a hamburger. Or pork is the other white meat after all. Why couldn't this be the blood of the pork? Why? Pork's not kosher. You wouldn't know that either unless you understood the Old Testament. That to talk about the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, is a reference direct and clear to the story of the Exodus. That God has a chosen people of all the people of the world. God says, I will invest in you. You will be mine, I will be yours, and the entire world will be blessed through you. They are held in bondage and captivity in Egypt. God hears their cries and he frees them. And there's this whole series of plagues to convince the Egyptians to let them go. The last one is death, and they are to take a spotless lamb. 
a lamb without blemish. They're supposed to use his blood, put it on the doorpost, angel death passes over, the firstborn does not die. That happens in the Egyptian homes, and so the children of Israel are allowed to escape. They're taken into freedom, into a promised land, but if you don't know, that's how the Exodus story goes, then this makes very, very little sense. Jesus isn't there to replace the Old Testament. Jesus is there to fulfill the Old Testament. So what he's opening up to the disciples is what could be opened up to us every time we open up the Old Testament. Because this is the plan that's happening from the beginning. That when we fall and when we fail, there in the garden, God already has a plan. And he tells them that. I even mentioned this a few weeks ago during Holy Week about how he tells Eve that from you... This seed of Eve from the woman, the, the serpent will bite his heel, but he will crush its head. And what happens on the cross? Christ, born of a woman, born of Mary, he dies on the cross like being struck by a serpent, but what looks like pain and death, he is actually crushing and defeating the power of Satan and death. That's from the very beginning, and it's fulfilled through Christ. But you don't read it, you don't know it, you might not see that connection or be able to connect the dots. Keep on moving through Genesis. We talk about Noah and the ark, how we're going to find an ark that we can find safety and life in the flood. That's Jesus. Keep on moving through and find Father Abraham and what is his promise? Not only really that he will have descendants as numerous as the stars, but that all the world will be blessed through his descendants. Who's the descendant? It's Jesus. If you don't know the Old Testament, you may miss what it means to be a Messiah, to sit on the throne of David. Who King David was, how he came about, how he was God's choice to lead his people. That God alone ought to be king, but when the people cry out to have a king to be like the other countries, he allows them to have Saul. Saul's a disaster, but he says, look, I've got a guy for you. And through that family, there will be an everlasting throne. And who comes from that family is Jesus. And we can look through the prophets. And we can hear from Daniel about the Son of Man. We can hear from Ezekiel how Israel, like dried up bones, will have the breath and life and spirit of God breathe back into them and they will truly live with the law no longer written like in a book or on stone tablets, but written on their hearts, written in their souls. You can read Isaiah, and you can find the Messiah as a servant who will suffer, that by his wounds we will be healed. He bears on himself the chastisement of us all. He was wounded for our transgressions, yet, like a sheep like a before its shears, he is mute and doesn't open his mouth. Those are the words of scripture that Jesus opens up to the disciples on the road of Emmaus and that we can have opened up to us if we will open up his word and read. So we can know, we can understand. But there's still a missing piece of the puzzle. Jesus teaches them. They have a Bible study. They totally get it. Oh my gosh, I now see all these things that I've heard all my life. I now finally understand 2 plus 2 really does equal 4, and A really does connect to B. But they still don't see him. When do they see him? They see him later that night. They say, dude, it's too far. It's late. Let's have some dinner. So he stays with them to eat. But we're going to open up the word and see why they see him then. So grab your Bibles. If you have a Pathway Bible, remember that what we're reading is from Luke chapter 24. It's page 1611. It's got one of those black few Bibles. It's uh, page 920. I see very little page flipping. <clears throat> uh, there's one to grow on. Let's read our Bibles. Okay, so we are chapter 24. 
34, and we're at verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Did you catch that? They, they, they hear the word, he has a Bible study, he teaches, they connect the dots, they understand 2 plus 2 equals 4, but when they see him is when he breaks bread. Well, that's weird. I mean, maybe it's like Jesus makes such a really, really great sandwich. Like, only Jesus can make a sandwich this good. Oh, I'm not. That's not what happens at all. So, we're going to put our finger here on Luke chapter 24, and we're going to flip a couple of pages to Luke chapter 22. That will be uh, 1605 in the Pathway Bible, or page 916 in the Bible. I still see 13 pages. Next time, grab a Bible. Okay. So if we look at verse 19 of Luke 22, we see something very familiar. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them. Huh. That's like identical. Exactly what he did and said in chapter 24 is exactly what he did and said in chapter 22. Huh. What are the odds? Isn't that funny? Well, if we go just a few verses before chapter 19, perhaps the context will make it more clear. When the hour came, starting at verse 14, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave to them, saying, This is my body for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It is identical. It is exact. They recognize him when he breaks the bread because he has communion with them. Just as he did in the upper room of the Last Supper, where he takes that Passover meal, and in that Last Supper institutes the first Eucharist, where he says, this bread is my body. It is broken for you. Take it. Be nourished and live. This was the same guy who said, I am the bread of the life of the world. My flesh is food indeed. My blood is drink indeed. And if you eat my flesh, you will have life within you. He takes that cup and he says, this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Just as his body will be broken on the cross and his blood will be shed, we receive these and take them inside of us. We believe his promise is true that when he says he is really there, he means it. And then we can take him inside of us. And he is not just with us, he is in us. And we are nourished, we are strengthened by having him inside of us, having him in our bodies, and we will live. You catch what happens here on the road of Emmaus. There's a Bible study. There's communion. They have church. Jesus has church there on Sunday morning, on Easter Sunday morning, there on the road. We just had a Bible study. We're going to have communion. It's just like Easter morning there on the road to Emmaus. Jesus has church with them. He teaches them the word. He teaches them the Old Testament, the law and the prophets, how it all connects, how it's all God's plan, how it all points to him. And then they have communion. They understand through the teaching of the word, but they see them in the breaking of the even on that very first Easter, there is word and sacrament. And it's like having a church service there on the side of the road. That's why our services are constructed the way that we are, that we will hear from his word. Old Testament and new. Okay? That's why we're going to get an Old Testament reading every single Sunday. That's why we're going to read from the Psalms, from the words of praise from Israel every single Sunday. That's why we're going to hear from an epistle and a letter with doctrine into the church, and we will hear from his gospel. I want to open these up to you. I want your own hearts to be open to him so that we can understand. But that's where we're going to see him. He's promised really to be there, that this is his body. This is his blood, so that he would be known to us 
in the breaking of the bread. We might understand as we study, but we would know him, see him, and love him for communion. Word and sacrament. Old Testament and new. It's what happens on the first Easter. It's what happens on the side of the road if they're going to this nowhere town. But it also can happen here and now, every single Sunday, every time we gather. But if you don't read your word, you might not understand it. If you don't read your word, you might not catch it. You might not be able to connect the dots. Read. Read, Mark, learn, and Emily digest. Go to Sunday school. Come to a Bible study. Read it on your own. With a prayer, Lord, open me up to your word as I open this word up so that I want to understand too. I want to understand how from beginning to end it's been plain to you and then come for the sacrament. <coughs> Through word and sacrament, we might not just know him, we will see him, we will love him, and he will dwell in us and we in him. His body. His blood. His eternal word. He had church with him there on the road to Emmaus. He is having church with us right here, right now. May we understand. May we get. Help us, Lord, connect these dots. But please, Lord, the eternal resurrected Christ be known to us today in the breaking of the breath.